Here we go. Matthew chapter number 7. I guess I need to open my Bible. Matthew chapter number 7. Let me give you the context. This is the closing moment of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is the most epic sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher ever to proclaim. Jesus Christ has been sitting on this grassy hill there outside of Galilee with a multitude of people. Hundreds, maybe thousands of people have come. And he is speaking to them about the new ethos of the kingdom of God that is being ushered in through him. And here at the conclusion of this great sermon, he gives us this picture. Verse number 24. Jesus says, Everyone then, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the wind blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. Verse 26. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the loss and the fall of it. Would you just bow for a word of prayer right now as we launch into this journey? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the privilege of being able to open up your word so that we might learn it, we might live it, and in doing so, we love it as though we've never loved it before. Father, there are so many voices, so many distractions, so many narratives in our culture today. It's easy to lose your voice. So, Father, we pray now over the next 40 days as we dive into your word that your whisper would become a roar in our heart and ears. And all those other voices that are roaring for our attention, they would be silenced as we look to your word and we hear your word. And to that end, we thank you in advance for all you're going to accomplish in Jesus' name. And together we said, amen. The Sermon on the Mount, the most epic message ever preached. Matthew is noting this as the beginning of Jesus' gospel as he's introducing this is what the kingdom of God is going to look like. And this is how you who follow me will see your life being lived. Oh, so many great points in that Sermon on the Mount. The Beatitudes. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They'll be filled. Blessed are those who mourn. They will be comforted. Oh, what wonderful words of comfort that Jesus offers us in the Sermon on the Mount. When he says, hey, don't worry about the things that those who do not love God worry about. Don't worry about what you will eat or what you will drink. For your Father in heaven knows all those things. But seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness and all these other things. They'll be added unto you. Jesus says, listen, I give you a new commandment. He says, not to hate your enemy, but to love your enemy. He says, this is what the kingdom of God is going to look like now that I have come and that the grace of God is exploding into the hearts and lives of humanity. And as he closes this epic sermon, he wants to land it. As every preacher wants to land it with something that the people can take away from. And he gives us a picture of two men who are building a home. And when we read it and we initially think of this story, this parable... We think that these are two guys who are really different. But when we look at it a little closer, Jesus is introducing us to two guys who have a lot in common. First of all, they both had a desire to build a godly life, to build a home. Both of these guys wanted to see that. They wanted to build a house where they could raise their family and they could... Uh, put down roots, and they could be a part of the community. They both had a godly dream. That's point one on the screen. And I want you to think about that. All of us have that. All of us desire to have that, don't we? That we want to be a people who build a home that is a place of love and care and respect and honor. 
so that our lives can be full and there's a resting place in our soul. But not only was it a guy, two guys who had this godly dream, they probably had very similar plans. I mean, let's face it. Homes in the ancient day were not overly, well, they just weren't Frank Lloyd Wright architecture. They had a foundation, they had some walls, a couple of rooms, and a roof. So the plans were probably very similar. They were also common in this. They both had received biblical teaching in their life. They had both received biblical teaching in their life. You know, when we read the story, we almost assume initially that one of these guys, the foolish guy, was a guy who was not a lover of God, that he didn't care about God's word, that he did not know God's word, that he had not heard God's word. But what we discover is both of these guys were evangelicals. They went to Bible-believing churches. Matter of fact, they had the greatest preacher ever to preach, preaching their sermons. They were orthodox in every way. They heard the message. They understood the message. So that's another commonality that they had. They both had a good dream, a godly dream. They had similar plans. They had heard biblical teachings. And here's the third thing they had in common. They both had to endure a storm. Jesus identifies both of these guys had to go through a storm, a storm where the rain fell down on the roof, the winds blew against the walls, and the floodwaters tried to, tried to erode the foundation. And so we see two guys that are not dissimilar. We see two guys, when you look on at them on the outward, they look very, very similar. Probably good guys, probably honorable guys. But that's where the similarities end. Jesus notes there is one remarkable contrast in these two very similar guys and it's this jesus says one of them was wise and the other one was foolish one was wise and the other one was foolish and we would ask the question why was one wise and why was one foolish well according to jesus the wise man was the man who not only heard the word the teaching, the principles, and the precepts that he had offered, but he was a man who applied them to his life, that he began to live them out, that this man was not just someone who came to church and he heard the message and he even agreed with the message and he clapped at the appropriate times and gave the pastor an encouraging amen occasionally. It wasn't that guy... uh, that, that guy alone wasn't wise. That guy actually became the foolish man because that's where it stopped for him. He never applied it to his life. He never started to live out the callings of Christ and the commands of Christ. See, a wise person is this, friends. According to Jesus, a wise person is one who hears the principles and precepts and the commandments of God, and they apply them to their daily lives. They begin to appropriate God's direction in their life and how they make their decisions, what drives their choices, what lifestyle decisions they'll make, how they will conduct themselves in business, how they'll conduct themselves in relationships. They say that God's word is not something I'm just adding to my life by which I have a point of knowledge, but rather a wise man says, these words are my life and I'm applying them to my life so that I might live them out. And Jesus says the foolish man is just the opposite. He is a guy who hears the word, claps for the word, honors the word, but he never honors it to the point by which he embraces it in his own life. He doesn't really care about loving his neighbor. He doesn't really care about submitting himself to the will and the purposes of God. He likes the stories. He likes the songs. But he never applies it to his life. And Jesus says this is what separates these two very, very similar guys is that one simply took a different step, a further step, and that was to apply God's Word to his life. When we think about God's Word in the Christian community of faith in the Western church, I believe that we may be facing this narrative in our culture today. That many of us know the Word, We know the gospel. We've even memorized a few verses. But when it really comes down to are we applying and put it into action, there may be a place of deficiency in our own life. 
this series is to help us not only to learn the Word, but that we would be a people who, say it with me, live the Word, to apply the Word, to jump in there and say, Lord, this is what your Word calls me to, and therefore I want to be that guy. Notice again, Jesus was very clear on this. If you have your Bibles open, I want you to note this. I want you to underline this. Jesus says, everyone then who hears these words. So hearing is important. It begins with hearing. He says, everyone that hears them and then does them will be like a wise man who built his house upon a rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, then he's like a foolish man. And the imaging he gives us is of two guys trying to build a home and one guy takes the shortcut method and the other guy does the necessary work to build a home that will sustain in the storm. I want you to think about the wise man. He was a rock builder, wasn't he? This is the wise man who builds his house on the rock of God's word. The foundation of his life, the foundation of his decisions, everything that, that builds up out of his life is, is rooted and, and founded on the rock of God's word. Uh, when you get into the Gospel of Luke in a couple of weeks, we're going to come to Luke chapter 6, and Luke records this same teaching from Jesus. But Luke gives us a bit more of a descriptive picture. He says that the wise man dug down deep and he laid the foundation on the rock. He gives us a little clearer picture of what that means, that he dug down deep. When we're going to dig down to the foundation, it's going to take a lot of work. It will take effort. It's going to cost us something. The guy who builds on the sand, well, you know, he doesn't have to spend all that extra money. He doesn't have to... Uh, exact that type of energy. He doesn't have to demand that type of effort. He just shows up and he says, hey, this looks like a nice place. It's sandy. He just flattens it out a little bit, lays a foundation, puts up the walls, puts the roof up, you know, lights the barbecue and gets the hot tub going. He's ready to live life big. Matter of fact, he's probably sitting in his Adirondack chairs as the coals are getting hot, watching his neighbor, thinking, look at that old sorry guy over there, having to do all that work to dig out all that mess to get down to... Why is he doing that? Let me tell you, friends, it may be a quicker way to build your life and your family and your marriage just by building on what you got. But I'm telling you, in the long run, it's going to cost you a lot more. It's worth digging down it's worth making sure we're getting the stuff out of our life that doesn't need to be there can i get an amen on this and get it out of our life so that we can root and we can anchor down into the word of god that is the foundation of our life because this is what's going to happen there will come a storm in our lives both men experience that and notice how this storm came it came from above the rains came down on it it came from the side. The winds blew against it. And it came from the bottom too. And the flood ro waters rose. I don't know if anybody else has discovered this in life, but I have. The, score, the storm doesn't care who you are. And it really doesn't even care about your foundation. It doesn't care if you're rich or poor. It doesn't care if you're educated or not. It is just going to show up. I was at the mailbox the other day and I thought about this because I got a letter from someone that says, to the current occupant of 1010. I thought that's how a storm feels. He doesn't care who lives there. He's just going to blow up against your house. He's just glad to be there. And if you and I have not done the necessary work to get down to the rock of the foundation, when the storm comes, boy, we're going to have a problem. And for some of us, God's been gracious because we're seeing some cracks in our wall. Let me explain to you what I mean. Several years ago when Pastor Jeff Rushing was uh, our administrative pastor, uh, we were walking around uh, the building here and I noticed these cracks above uh, the door. And I said, hey, Jeff, we, we need to get that fixed. He said, I'll do that, Pastor Troy. I'll get someone out here. And he, they came out there and they mudded it over and they sanded it down and they painted it and it looked great. Well, just a few weeks later, I was walking by that same place and I noticed the cracks had come back. 
And so I called Pastor Jeff, and I said, Pastor Jeff, uh, we need to fix this. Apparently, that guy didn't know what he was doing. Bring him back out. Well, he came back out, and he did it again, painted it again, and it looked great. Well, three or four weeks later, guess what? They came back once again, and I said, Jeff, I think it's time to get somebody else. He said, well, let, let him come out here, and let's see if maybe he can help. He comes out here, and he's looking at it and looking at it, and he says, well, pastors, I can tell you this. The problem's not the wall. The problem's the foundation. The foundation has shifted or settled a little bit. And we can keep trying to fix this patch and these cracks. Or the real fix is to fix the foundation. Friends, maybe some of the things we're facing in our homes, in our lives, in our finances, in our relationships, maybe what we're doing is we're just trying to put too much mud on cracks. And what we need to do, someone give me an amen here. What we need to do is we need the hard work of digging down to the foundation, which means we not only hear God's word, but now we are applying God's word to our life so that when those winds come, when the shifting current of of society comes, we are able to remain. Digging is costly in time and effort, but in the end, you and I will be glad that we did. Jesus says, don't be this foolish man. Now listen, we don't know exactly who all was in. We don't know exactly who was all in that great crowd on the day that Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. The Bible says multitudes. But there is a chance that there was a guy named James there. And I think there's a high probability that James was there because James was one of the half-brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. She's one of Mary's other boys with Joseph, the earthly father of Christ. And, and James would be late coming to faith in Christ, but he ultimately would come to faith in Christ. Matter of fact, James would become one of the great leaders in the first century church. He pastored the church at Jerusalem, and he had to navigate some really difficult times in the first century church. But he also did this. He wrote to us what many believe, and I'm a part of this group, that the book of James was the very first letter written in the New Testament. I know it's not at the beginning of the New Testament, but the New Testament is not put together in chronological order. But James is believed to have been the very first author of what would become letters of the New Testament. And do you remember how he set, begins it? Hey, count it all joy when you'd fall into diverse trials and tribulations knowing this. We could say it like this. Don't freak out when you find yourself in a storm of life. Because there's some things we know. That the testing of our faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect work, and then you'll be complete, lacking no good thing. So James begins his letter to believers to say, there are storms and there are difficult times. And they would say, okay, we get that, but how do we make sure that we are prepared for these storms and these tribulations? And James tells us, take your Bible, open there to James, if you will, James chapter number 1, and just keep your Bible open there in James. James is in the New Testament towards the end. You may have to go to the table of contents. That's okay. That's why it's there. If you don't want to go there because of pride, go to the book of maps and go back to the left. Now, I want you to hear what James has to say. Well, Brother James, Pastor James has to say to us this morning. James chapter 1, verse number 22. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Do you hear the echo of the Sermon of the Mount here? That James is echoing what Christ is saying. The wise man is the man who hears and who does. And when the storms of life come... He is going to be able to be sustained by the foundation of God's Word. James is writing to believers in the first century, and he says, this is important for you to know. It's not enough to simply be a hearer of the Word. We must do the Word, or we must apply the Word of God to our life. For if we hear only and we're not applying, we are deceiving ourselves. We're fooling ourselves. And the problem is, 
the reality of that deception is identified through the storms of life that come. So James is saying to that first century group, and he would say to us through the eternal word of God, it is important that you and I live as people who not only hear the word, but we do the word. Matter of fact, he gets very, very strong with this. If you'll jump on down to James chapter number 2, flip over there. And I'm going to read this, these next 12 verses for you. They're some of the most controversial verses in all the Bible. I'll tell you right up front. But by the grace of God, I'm going to unpack them for us so that we see that they're not in contradiction to the Word of God at all. They're in complete agreement with the whole counsel of God's Word. Listen to what James says. James chapter 2, beginning with verse number 14. He says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? We could say it like this without doing violence. What good is it if you hear God's word but you don't apply God's word? That it's not being played out of your life. And he asked this question, can faith save him? If a brother or sister is poor or poorly, la- poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and you say to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for their body, what good is that so also faith by itself if it does not have works is dead verse 18 but someone will say you have faith and I have works show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works you believe that God is one you do well But even the demons believe and they shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person? Do you hear that? Jesus' words from the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount being echoed here. You got to do the word, you got to hear the word, you got to do the word. If you don't, you become what? A foolish person is what James is saying. He's simply echoing this. He says, verse 20, Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. Verse 24. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers that were and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. What in the world is James saying here? Listen, I want to be abundantly clear in this. If you lean into nothing else today, lean into this moment. Because I I want to really unpack this for you because this has become a divisive passage of Scripture in the New Testament and it ought not to be. I want you to hear this. You and I and everybody else who's ever been saved, they've been saved one way. They've been saved by the grace alone and the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ plus nothing else. There's nothing else. Paul says it like this in Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you have been saved, not by works, lest no man should boast. He's saying there's only one way for you to come into a right relationship and be saved from your sins, and that is through the finished and completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross, His death, burial, and resurrection. And when you come to Him, believing that you're a sinner and there is no other means by which you might be saved, and you trust Him and Him alone, nothing you've done, not your good works, not your good deeds, not your moral uh, excellence, none of those things, that you come to Him. The only thing you and I bring to our salvation is our own sinfulness nothing else if you add anything whatsoever to the equation of salvation that you're saved by grace through faith plus nothing else then you have done harm to the gospel so we read this from James and we say well therefore was James and Paul disagreeing 
Are they arguing? Not at all. They're in perfect agreement. It's two different perspectives, though. Paul is speaking about the root of our salvation. James is talking about the fruit of our salvation. Paul is saying if they were in a conference together and Paul got up and he preached, you are saved by grace through faith plus nothing else, James would sit on the platform and say, Amen, Brother Paul, that's good preaching. And that afternoon session when Paul gets, or James gets up to preach, and James gets up and he says, if you say you have faith, If you say that you've been saved by the grace of God, this God who sent His one and only Son to earth to be the propitiation, the sacrificial sacrifice for your sin, to stand in your place, to go to the cross, and to bear the wrath of God, and to shed His blood for the forgiveness of your sin, and that this God, so good and so gracious, sent the Holy Spirit to draw you, to help you realize your need for a Savior. And when you confess Him, that the Holy Spirit of the living God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead now abides in you, if you're saying that that has no impact on your life, That it does not change your outlook, your behaviors, your desires, your passions. James is saying there is a problem with your experience of grace. Listen, I know this isn't happy, clappy preaching this morning. But I'm telling you, we have a problem that James had in his day. And that problem was this. A lot of people were confessing Jesus Christ as Lord. A lot of people heard the message of Christ that Jesus came and died for their sins. A lot of people could recite that. But there was no transaction of transformation of their life by the grace of God as they now lived it out and walked out the commandments of the Lord Jesus. I'm telling you, you're telling me that you can be saved by God Almighty. His spirit can abide inside of you and it doesn't change your attitude. It doesn't change our desires. It never brings a conviction in our life about certain habits and issues of our life. I'm telling you, we need to get back to the word of God that says when he comes into our life, there is a transformation that should take place. Hallelujah be to God. I'm going to preach this anyway. I got to preach it, but I'm going to preach it. The litmus test of the Christian life is not that I have a bumper sticker. It's not that I even showed up. It's not that I can recite to you John 3, 16. The real litmus test of the Christian life is that the living God has entered my dead life and He is transforming me into the likeness of Jesus Christ. That's it. And Paul would be in complete agreement. Why, how do I know that? Because it's what he said in, in Romans chapter 12. He says, therefore, based on all that God did for us in Jesus Christ, sending His Son to be our sacrifice, he says, I urge you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself a living sacrifice. For this is your reasonable act of worship. Therefore, no longer be conformed to this world. No longer live like the world. No longer think like the world. No longer conduct your business like the world. No longer hate your enemy like the world. But be transformed by the power of God's word in your life that you may be an example of what the kingdom of God is like as Christ is living in and through you. Hallelujah be to God. That's it. That was very high pitched. I'm sorry. <laughs> we, we have forgotten this part. But Jesus says this is the difference between the wise man and the foolish man. He lives it out. Let me put it in this context. Parents and students, you can probably understand this illustration. Imagine. As a parent or imagine as a student, your parents came to you, your dad came to you and said, hey, listen, I need you. I love you. I've given you a great place. But I I want you to go clean your room, please. And because you heard him, you said, all right, and you head up to your room. And three hours later, you come back. And uh, your dad says, hey, did, did you clean your room? He said, dad, dad, let me tell you. I heard what you said three hours ago, and I'm t- it's powerful. It's powerful. <laughs> Matter of fact, I got on social media, and I sent out some tweets, and I'm working on a TikTok video right now. 
I sent out a text to my friends, and we're going to meet this, after, this evening. We're going to meet at the coffee shop, and we're going to have a small group around this command, clean your room. And I'm telling you, we're just going to sit and go deep. We're going to deep dive this thing about cleaning our room, and, and we're just going to be real, and we're going to be authentic. Matter of fact, Dad, I even wrote a song. I, I wrote a song. I wrote a song about this. You want to hear it, Dad? What a beautiful room it is. My shoes are put away. The bed, it's been made. What a beautiful, hallelujah. Until finally, Dad says, wonderful. Let's go back to previous question. Have you cleaned your room? Well, no. No. I mean, clean your room doesn't mean clean your room, does it? I'm doing all this other stuff. We're even talking to a t-shirt maker. It was calling it, what would, how would Jesus clean his room? And we as parents would never say, well, look at all this other wonderful stuff you did, but you didn't do that, so it doesn't matter. We would say, upstairs, clean your room. And maybe we've spent so much time trying to figure out all this other stuff that what we have forgotten to do is simply what Jesus said to do. I want you to love your neighbor. I want you to serve your wife. I want you to raise up your kids in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. I want you to forgive the guy who said those things about you. I want you to pray for those who persecute you. I want you to live humbly before me. If 40 days in the Word simply becomes us obtaining more head knowledge and gives us greater theology without any footology, we have failed. Because the reality is, the storm that comes, listen friends, it becomes the proof text of have we applied God's Word to our life. From the man and the woman, the family that says, God, not only will we hear your words on Sunday morning, but God, we're going to settle down and we're going to, by your grace, live them out. Let me, now listen, I, am I talking about sinless perfection? No. Am I talking about batting a thousand? No. But I'm talking about a heart that turns itself to God, that says, God, I am so thankful for what I know. Now, Lord, help me to live out what I know so that through it you might be glorified and I may be anchored on the rock. Pastor Jason comes as I close. Jesus is not talking about a class on physical construction for general contractors. Jesus is talking about this is what it means to live and build a spiritual life one of the things that I thought about that's such a different idea than in our day than theirs. Did you know that the median average stay in a home in America today is 13 years? 13 years. So though we buy a home and we think we're going to be there a while, most of us aren't there forever. But in their day, in Jesus' day, in the ancients' days, when they would build their home, they were truly building it not only for their life, but for the generations that would follow. They would build their home on their ancestors' land, and they would build a home, and oftentimes that home now gets handed down to the next generation, or the family builds on to the home that was built. I believe what Jesus is saying. I'm not just talking about building your life. I'm talking about building a home and a life that now you can pass down these truths from generation to generation. That your sons and your daughters and your grandsons and granddaughters, they're going to take these truths and they're going to hear them and they're going to be anchored in them. Too much we sing, too much we talk about the individual experience. 
when Christ calls us to a collective experience. That's why we as a church, we're reading through all this together. We're journeying together. Yes, He came to save you individually, but the rejoice should also be He came to save us. To call us. In the closing sermon that Moses ever gave, Moses, the greatest pastor who ever lived, it's recorded in Deuteronomy, the recounting of the whole Exodus story. Now the old man, weak, towards the end of his journey, stands before the congregation of Israel. And with all those grandparents and parents, young families and children and babies being held in mother's arms, he gives them these last words. Deuteronomy 32, 46 and 47. Take to heart all the words by which I am warning and writing and speaking to you today. Take them to heart. Listen to them. That you may command them to your children. That they may be careful to, say it with me, do. All that is, all the words of this law. For these are no empty words for you. These are not vain words. He says, these words are your very life. And by this word you shall live long in the land that I'm giving you. 3,500, 4,000 years ago, an old prophet stood up before his congregation. And with great urgency, he said, these are not mere words. These are your life. And by the grace and the sovereignty and the providence of God, I stand before this congregation in, in Oconee County and Morgan County. And I say to us this morning with a fervency and the anointing and the grace of God, the words that I have spoken to you today are not mere words. These are our life. And by hearing them and living them out, we will live long and prosperous in the land so that when the storms come, when the clouds part and the sun rises again, we'll step out and we'll say, how faithful is our God. How great is His grace and how marvelous is His word that holds us.